thank Anton Block for hosting this event. We're very excited about it. We have five amazing companies. I want to invite Chris up here to just say hello on behalf of Anton. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Noble, and I'm a partner at Anton, servicing the software and technology industry. I want to thank everyone for coming, even though the very, very cold weather. Uh, I, I primarily service the software technology industry. We are a 350 person accounting firm with experts in other industries, but that's uh, my uh, area. <clears throat> Some of the things that we do for our companies are tax credits and incentives, uh, tax audit work, and exit strategies. So if you'd like to discuss further, please feel free to reach out to myself or Ricky Walgroom back there. He's our tax credit guy. And uh, look forward to meeting everyone. Enjoy. Thanks. All right, so we're in for a wonderful evening of presentations. We have five amazing companies. We have three great panelists. Before we do some introductions here, I want to tell you what else we have coming up. So MIT Enterprise Forum, we are a volunteer organization. And I was told by Stephanie back there, who's laughing. Stephanie, go ahead and say hello. That, as always, we are looking for volunteers. I feel like I should be Uncle Sam, standing up here and saying, we want you. But we do. We really want you. We're, we are. Um, Stephanie, you want to? volunteering in any capacity, either to work on an event or to work on the website. We have a lot of great events coming up this spring and next fall, as well as the female entrepreneurship program for um, high school students this summer, which last summer we did, and it worked with this event with you. Please talk to me. Yeah, okay, I'm going to repeat that. Various capacities. I'm going to repeat that. So one of the things that, that we've had a lot of fun with is actually, that one of the goals that we have is trying to promote entrepreneurship <coughs> among high school girls, maybe even younger. But one of the things we did last summer was an event where we had 17 or 18 New York City high school girls. We spent a week with them teaching them about entrepreneurship. And we're doing that same event, but we're, we're doing it for two weeks instead of one this coming summer. So we're always looking for volunteers, people to help out, people to mentor. We're also looking for volunteers to just help us with events and get involved in the organization. Katja over here, who's also smiling, was a volunteer once and came up with the brilliant idea for our so the future of X events, which have been very successful. So, so um, that was my volunteer pitch. If you're interested, talk to Stephanie afterwards, or talk to me, or any one of the other MIT Enterprise Forum board members here. We'll be doing a volunteer event, hopefully around ice cream, or something fun and exciting when the weather gets a little warmer. Um, I want to tell you about an upcoming event. We have March 12th, an upcoming event called um, What's Up With Drones? Uh, it's, it will be a panel event on March 12th. Uh, also, towards the end of March, we have a large event, Dream It, Code It, Win It. It's, a, it's our second annual event. Um, we have a financing event, uh, an event where we're discussing finance back here, I think, at Anshin, March 24th. And we have our next think tank session, The Future of X, where we're going to be talking about the future of music in April. So, hope you can come. You enjoy this event. We are, um, I'm going to ask my panelists to introduce themselves, and then we're going to get started with Greatly. My name is Bob Green. I'm one of the two partners at Contour Venture Partners here in New York. We're what we call a micro VC firm. Uh, we manage a current fund of about $50 million, and we like to meet companies and invest in them at their early stage, the first year of life, when they're doing their seed or Series A rounds. We typically write, typically write a first check of about anywhere you know, from $200,000 to $1 million, depending on the circumstance. We usually do these. Uh, financings and small syndicates or others, so we're buying a third or a half of the round. Well, we do it by ourselves, we're very flexible, and uh, we focus almost all of our investments of the 45 companies we backed over the past eight years. Almost all of them are here, right here in New York, which we love. We go home at night, uh, we can work very closely together uh, that way, uh, and we focus on the industries that are dominant in New York and where we have some experience. So it's fintech, ad tech, uh, SaaS software, uh, digital media, and e-commerce. Hi, uh, my name is Charles Smith. I'm a venture partner at a uh, seed fund uh, based both in New York and in San Francisco called Social Starts. Um, Social Starts does uh, moment of inception funding, so we want to be first money in uh, and series A. Um, we focus on media platforms, marketing platforms, um, ad tech, and we do a lot of media investing. Um, we are in the fifty to seventy-five thousand dollar investment range, 
Um, and we are particularly um, focused right now on mobile and are just launching into um, doing mobile commerce investing. Um, and we also have a Series A fund, which uh, extends in our pro rata into that fund. Um, thank you for having me. Hi, you know, Sachin Jay, founding partner of Clifford Capital here in New York. Uh, we are an innovation and investment firm, so we spin off companies purely in fintech, a Chinese wall of separation into investments that go with uh, a core thesis of impact investing, so a lot of social cause based investing. And uh, also, what we look at is more disruption oriented, whether it's platform technologies, healthcare, education, and so on. Uh, we are Early stage, but we are also we call it a balanced stage, but skewed more towards the early stage. Great. Okay. So <clears throat> rules of the road: um, five minute pitches, and we're going to try to keep you to those five minutes. Katja sitting in the front, way below. Okay. <laughs> so when it's one minute, she will give you some sign, and then when five minutes are up, she's going to give you another sign. So it means wrap it up. And then what we'll do is we'll have um, a few minutes of commentary from the judges, a few minutes of commentary from the audience, and, and hopefully a lot of fun. Um, my name is Sarah Bryden brown and um, I'm here to present Greatly. This is my third startup. Um, the first one I did was in Australia, and we sold that to News Corp. And then I came here to New York and did Babel, and that went to Disney. So this is my third, but it's my first time out front, um, which is completely different, and you lose a lot more sleep. Um, so Greatly is a culmination of those two startups and my previous um, career in old media as a magazine editor and a newspaper reporter. And basically what we've done is we've created a platform that builds small businesses through um, aggregating the value of one another and connecting them. So it's a growth hack for makers, which is the maker economy. It's revenue for tastemakers, which are bloggers, social influencers, publishers, um, mastheads, and it's the win for shoppers. So what problem are we solving with Greatly? Um, we're actually delighting rather than disrupting. In terms of the makers, they're very good at making, but they're terrible at marketing, and they would much prefer to make than to um, market. And on Etsy or other platforms that are similar, they have to do all the work themselves. The maker economy is booming um, in the US and the UK, and the White House has created a maker unit to um, to promote this maker economy because it is one of the biggest drivers of the small business economy. And we're talking about small, small batch manufacturing, handmade and artisanal. On the tastemaker side, which is the second half of the platform, um, they have built audiences online that everyone taps when they build a business online to get them to talk about it because that's how you see an audience. Um, they don't know how to monetize it beyond advertising and that's very spiky. Um, you can't control that. You have to wait to be on a campaign or um, you have to know, you know, be picked up by an ad platform. So this way they can control their revenue by making money out of promoting the products that they've been doing since day one on their blogs or in magazines um, without compromising editorial integrity or um, their audience's expectation. The other interesting data about the tastemakers is that um, right now, um, the, the number one acceptable revenue method according to their audiences is e-commerce, but only 17% of them are accessing it because they don't know how to set up a, a shop online and they're on their own and they have to buy inventory and it's really not easy. And by 2020, 40% of the workforce is going to be independent workers. So this is tapping into a revenue stream for these people that they've been um, foregoing. We tick all the boxes in terms of what makes people shop online by having the tastemakers curate the maker products on Greatly and sell them direct to their audiences on their blogs or in the magazines or on social. So basically we provide um, a revenue stream for, for activity that's already happening. So this is how it works. So makers load up, um, it's all heavily curated. So you have to apply and be approved. So we have right now 700 makers from all over the world on the site, loading up their products and making relationships with the tastemakers. In whatever market, it doesn't matter. Um, the one cart checkout services all makers. You don't have to buy separately. Um, you can shop from the Ukraine, you can shop from Australia. 
Um, and the shopper wins because they already read the blogs or the magazines or follow the Pinterest boards and they love the products. Now they can just click through and buy from Greatly knowing that they're shopping their favourite's favourite. The differentiator for Greatly over a number of other platforms um, that are e-commerce driven is it's the only one that brings the two constituents of the equation together on the one platform that work together um, in concert. This is a case study of a, of, a, um, of a product that sold out in like three hours based on the maker and the tastemaker collaborating on design. Our community right now is 250 tastemakers who reach 50 million people um, around the world. By the end of this year, that will be 500 people reaching 100 million people. Makers have already been making, shoppers already shop. We've added the tastemaker layer to connect it up to make it um, a more valuable and seamless <coughs> process for everybody. We have a number of product iterations coming, a matchmaker tool, and, and other um, easily accessible product um, variants for tastemakers to accelerate. We've been going for just under a year. We raised half a million in Angel by the end of last year. Um, we presented at Web Summit in Dublin. Um, we had revenue from day one with 1.5 million in inventory. We have all the assets are already on the site. They're already being successful independently and we've brought them together. And I'm going to say thank you now. These are some of our partners and we've been presented in um, the Wall Street Journal, El Decor, Yahoo, Owls, and Country Living, Hearst has signed on, Lonnie Livingly Media, so our tastemaker has been elevated now to a publisher level. And we're hosting a pop-up shop at the Architectural Digest Home Show in New York City in March, and we'd love to see you all there. That's our team, it's very small, but we um, get a lot done. You said uh, you already raised 500k? Correct. Uh, what has that primarily gone for? Product. Uh, product? Yes. Uh, and how do you sort of distribute and market yourself? As in, do you, part of my friends, but with the dog food kind of thing, do you use your own influencer network? Or? Yes. So the two startups that I did, um, the one in Australia and the one in um, New York, both accessed bloggers for their traffic to build the audience that then was sold to the publishers, News and Disney. So I realized that they're being tapped, but they're not being made part of a business model. So um, I had a database of 650 of them that I built after I left um, Disney when I finished my contract. And so I wanted to build them a product that would help them build their revenue. And so that seeded greatly. Uh, the transactions all happening within Greatly, or is it distributed across the Tastemaker network? It's all uh, Greatly. We own the shopper, we own the transaction, we own the credit card, we own the information. And uh, what, are, what, are the, what are the splits? 60% to the maker, 25% to the tastemaker, and 15 to Greatly. Um, and the value of um, for us is obviously the more transactions, our revenue grows. But with member services is another area where we will start to um, offer for our tastemakers and our makers to make their lives even easier. So say fulfillment for makers, photography, um, for tastemakers, um, product development and merchandising and manufacturing. So we can build in um, member service revenue on top of our 15%. You, you spoke about all the products that come on greatly being curated. Just walk me through the curation process for the use case. Um, right now, it's me. Um, being an editor in my old career, um, I know how to pick things, and so I'm approving all the makers, and then the tastemakers are also bringing on their own makers with products that they know that their readers want. So it's now coming off my plate, and the tastemakers are owning that process now that they can see the value of um, you know, being heavily curated. There is nothing on there that someone doesn't want via somebody. So is the tastemaker finding a friend or a product they like, putting it on here, and then writing about it? So a tastemaker sets up a self-branded store on Greatly with their own um, real estate, so they own that real estate on Greatly in terms of that's their, 
their place and they link to that, then they will curate collections and then they'll um, put them like content marketing, except it's product, um, it's e-commerce, it's not advertising, through their content on their blogs. Or they literally, they pin it all on Pinterest and you know you get a ton of traffic and you sell everything. Pinterest is our number one converter. Okay, so what, what happens though, the one you said earlier about you, you being a curator, you having a taste of where you were, what if you bring uh, makers in and then you have to find, you want to find some of your other tastemakers to comment on them, right? Well, if you're a tastemaker and you bring in your own makers, you can have them exclusively. So the back end facilitates a maker loading up product and ticking a box and only that tastemaker can stock with that product. So it's like a mall, in a sense, in that respect. But tastemakers are all, kind, are all independent um, shops on Gravely who have access to, you know, we have around 40,000 products right now um, on the site um, from all over the world. So the Ukraine is like huge. Israel is massive for art for us. Um, and so they they then curate those products, but they'll bring their own makers on. So Country Living that came on through Hearst had a list of 50 people that we brought on just for Hearst. And so they work with them exclusively, but we, we suggest to them after a period of time to open it up to other, make, to other tastemakers too. Um, when did you launch? May um, 2014. And so what has traffic growth been like? What has revenue growth been like? Uh, talk a bit about those metrics. Sure. Month on month, um, over 100%. Um, we are sitting on an incredible gold mine. And because there's three of us, we've kept a lid on it. But if we tell 50 tastemakers to post in one week, our traffic goes through the roof and our sales go through the roof. And we've practiced different models to see what would happen with your free shipping. We did. 50 from one country, we did 50 from different countries, we did a theme where we asked everyone to write about a certain topic. Um, so traffic, unusually traffic is not my issue. I could have a million users tomorrow if I wanted to. It's tapping into the tastemakers and having them promote and um, put a, a widget on their site, then there's constant traffic in. It's having them have a mobile app where they can publish to social every five minutes if they wanted to. Um, we don't have the resources right now. That's what the raise is for to build a, a team and a product team to be able to cope with it. Because when it comes and we've done it as experiments and we can change the numbers tomorrow, um, we have to manage it. And um, and so makers are shipping directly. Correct. And uh, what are your plans for adding um, support? and uh, understanding the shipping issues and all the things involved with that. Right now we have a partnership with Shipping Easy, which is a cloud-based shipping solution. Um, the CEO of that was my old CEO of my first startup, and she's an angel, so it's a little connected. Um, but basically it allows them to have an automated process that puts the tracking number into the greatly um, dashboard, because they all have a dashboard, they can see their data, they can um, understand exactly what's happening in their shop, and then it also if they're on Etsy or they have Shopify or Big Cartel, wherever they are, it gets populated into every platform for them so that there's no need to only, you know, to have to go into different places. That's all we do right now. But we want to solve that entire problem for them. So what we've solved marketing for them, now we want to solve shipping. Two questions. One, who do you think is your most uh, valuable asset, whether it's the base maker or the actual product maker itself? That's a really good question. Number one. And follow-up question to that is, I heard a number one and a half million in your presentation and refresh my memory what exactly that was. And I'm going to have a follow-up on that depending on the answer. Mm -hmm. The 1.5 million was the inventory that we had on the site on day one. So we we um, we we built the site unusually. We built it in three parts. So we built the maker side first, had them all come in and populate. Then we built the tastemaker level, had them come in and stock. Then we opened to the public. So on day one, we were ready to go. There was no beta. We just went straight into it. So the 1.5 was the inventory. I go back and forth all the time. Um, some days it's like, oh my god, it's all about the maker, and then it's like, no, 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 it's all about the tastemaker, no, no, it's about the shopper. And, you know, I've heard a lot of feedback from VCs, like, you can't have a three-sided marketplace, you can't even have a two-sided marketplace, marketplaces are hard. I'm like, well, this isn't a hard marketplace because everyone's already doing it. We're just making them do it together. I would say the maker, because we're going to own the tastemaker's audience in about a year. 
and that we are then going to become a traffic driver for the tastemaker. And their curation is going to be key, but greatly as a brand is now actually out in front, which I didn't expect to happen. But Architectural Digest asked us to host a pop-up shop. It's a great big pop-up shop. Um, Wall Street Journal wrote about us before Christmas. They wrote about greatly. So I didn't anticipate that. So I think, I think it's the maker. Tell me if I'm wrong. This is a somewhat, I'm, I've spent a lot of time at Etsy, so this is a somewhat important opinion. Um, it's the maker, and um, you have to take sides. I'm a parent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. Yeah, in your case, it's the maker. Yeah. Typically, when you have a marketplace, uh, the two-sided or three-sided equation, you have to cut the cord somewhere. Yeah. And it depends on your strengths and the market and the total result market, etc. which cord you cut to actually get into the market and then go grow from there. Yeah. But in your specific case, it's the market. Yeah. I guess one last follow-up question would be, who are your competitors? And yeah. why wouldn't they have a million and a half assets or the inventory on day one? They probably have more. Um, nobody does exactly what we do. So Etsy has the maker, but the taste maker doesn't exist. So the maker can't find their way through the billion makers on there to put. So they ask the taste makers to write about them on the blog to get them to sell product, but the taste maker's not making any money out of that. And that is spiky, just like ad revenue. Taste maker can put Shopify, Big Cartel, some other kind of co you know cart on their blog. They then have to go by inventory get a developer, put it on, and then promote it, and they're on their own. There's, no one's helping them find makers, no one's helping them do everything. We provide the tools to allow small businesses to own a business without having to run a business. And that's both a maker, a tastemaker, um, and now publishers too. So Post, for example, is we're doing all the work for them. Um, we're like a unit, with, you know, external to them. But we're going to grow their e-commerce revenue through their audiences without them having to do anything. And, um, and we're going to get their audience, which is really valuable to us. Um, so our biggest um, competitor right now, because the makers are coming into roads, we can't, we, we can't say yes quick enough to them. They will go where the money is, and they'll go where they're being promoted, and the accolades and the imprimatur of being on our site and having a particular tastemaker promote you, they go crazy on social, say, oh my gosh, I'm in mean, blah blah's greatly shop. So we get the double hit. Um, but in terms of um, you know the value, once the tastemakers set up real estate on greatly, um, they're not going to do that anywhere else because they're invested in that. Their brand's more important than greatly. They put it on their blog, they put it on the greatly thing that goes all through their social. That's very hard to undo. Hey. Do you ever get uh, questions of conflict? People are saying, well, you know, these case makers are self-promoting. You know, they get 25% of the action or... Uh, <coughs> no, because it's, um, it's, it's product that they would promote anyway. So, for example, when the Wall Street Journal wrote about us and the, and the, um, the, edit, the editor of the story um, curated the art collection for Christmas and she chose it all from Greatly and they didn't even put a link in the story because they're a newspaper and so their audience had to go and type it all in and we still sold a ton of art. Now there's no reason that Wall Street Journal shouldn't have taken 25% of all of those sales because there was no compromise of editorial integrity. There was no, she, there was no um, question of, you know, did, is that what she wanted her readers to have? Yes. Um, the makers aren't, it's not, we're not talking about Clorox. And so um, there's a sense of integrity about helping a maker build their small business as well. So that is something that is built into a lot of the commentary around these products is this person has a story and they're a one-man band and I'm helping them grow. Or they're a small business and I'm helping them grow. Okay. <laughs> that was great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Insights. Um, we're transforming event marketing using proprietary data science. A little less exciting than 
consumer marketplace, but a, a really interesting business to be in. So the first question I like to address is what's the size of this market? Because people don't really have a, an appreciation for what event marketing really is and, and, and you know, what the volumes of, of revenues are within it. So if you look at the Frost and Sullivan number, $565 billion are spent on event marketing. And according to Gartner, 21% of that money is allocated to marketing analytics. So that puts the event marketing analytics space at $118 billion. It's a huge market. Um, so, so to solve the problems for our customers, we look at it in, in a few ways. Um, my background is in the event, mar in, in the event space. Um, I founded a company called eTouches, which is one of the top global platforms in event registration and management. So I've been around the space for many, many years. And through that experience, um, a few things have happened over the last few years that I observed. When I first started selling eTouches to customers back in 2009, 2010, many of our customers weren't even collecting data. They were taking registrations on forms, people were sending them emails. Um, it was just remarkable, the, the, the condition of the data. Fast forward to now, the whole category of event tech has been born. And now, event organizers have probably somewhere between four and seven different data collection tools they're using around their events. Those are all disparate. In many cases, they're using different tools for different events, so their data is all over the place, and they have just a tsunami of data coming over the transom. The problems that they're, they're, they, they have with not being able to really wrangle that data you know, one is what we call the event gap. So experiential marketers and corporations, a lot of people have no idea what I'm talking about. You don't even know what the event ecosystem looks like. But within corporations, um, they have two sides of meetings and events. But the experiential side is the marketers using events to, to do their marketing, right, as opposed to digital marketing and, and the other things that they do. The digital marketing world has had sophisticated data analytics tools for quite some time now. And when you imagine an event marketer and a digital marketer going to the CMO of the company and talking about the value that they're bringing, digital marketers can, can show all kinds of information, reports, analytics, and really, really quantify the ROI on the, on the money that they're spending. Event marketers can't. So that gap is growing. And that's, that's also plays into the audience expectation side. So in digital marketing, we're all used to being known. We go to a website, we go to Netflix, Audible Books, whatever it is you do online, we know you, you know, they know you when you get there, they recognize what you've done in the past, and also start telling you what you might be interested in doing in the future. If you think about the event space, nothing has changed in terms of knowing the audience better. So if you market an event, if we were all gonna go to this, or be invited to the same event, we would all be invited in exactly the same way, with exactly the same email, the, exactly the same marketing, and we'd have exactly the same experience at the event. In large part because event marketers don't, haven't had tools traditionally to really understand their audience. So that's where InsightXM comes in. So we've pioneered a methodology to bring together neuroscience, data science, domain expertise, and machine intelligence to really provide actionable insights for our customers. We aggregate our customer data, which is a task in and of itself. We then enrich that data with social and third-party data, do the analysis, and then this is a really critical part, inform. So we don't just hand the information back to our customers. Because of our domain expertise, we help them understand how to translate that into actionable insights. So some of the things we think about, audience acquisition, optimizing the attendee experience, increasing value, and really being able to demonstrate ROI, and things like developing understanding of audience personas and social influencers. In terms of competition, um, we, don't, we haven't been able to find a company that's really organized in this way, focused specifically on this very large experiential marketing space. So again, bringing together the science, the domain expertise, and the machine learning to put it into a SaaS platform is, is a, a very unique offering. Why do we think we can do it? So this is sort of the, 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 the founding team, uh, myself, Chet Rubenstein, Joseph Carabas, and Todd Ro Rossholt. And I organized this to talk about what I think is important. Do we have experience across the three most, you know, the three critical um, factors in being able to be successful with this business? So technology, startup and, and domain expertise, and we have that covered. 
few highlights. Um, we launched the company in April, um, and from start, you know, no product built. Um, we've closed annual contracts with Dell, IBM, and IACCM. We hit our targets in 2014. We have a growing number of proprietary technologies within our SaaS platform. We are in due diligence for a seed round, and um, we're looking to syndicate that. Um, and um, there you go, very large pipeline. This Gartner quote is, I think, relevant. Um, this, is, this is a conversation between me and this Gartner analyst as we're preparing for our Gartner um, analyst briefing, and you know, identifies the problem himself that we're trying to solve. So thank you very much. What's the source of, what's the original seed data? Is it, uh, I think you say about something in conferences, they can be live, they can be virtual. Uh, is it the registrations and, and uh, there are emails and there, uh, maybe they're uh, LinkedIn or they're Facebook, if you log, they log in that way, you start there? Yeah, so, so the answer is yes, the source of data is our customer's data. So we start there and our customer's data can be um, event technology, so, so event automation, marketing automation, Salesforce automation, and then whatever they've collected across those, those, different, um, those different technologies. And is the customer always a marketer or is it an event company or is it... Yeah, so the event ecosystem is corporate event marketers, um, trade shows, memberships. So IACCM, one of our customers, is a membership organization. It's really, our market is really anybody who runs events. And, you know, that's a pretty broad, that's a pretty broad category. If you go to one of those, you said. Yeah. Take this event, for example. So what would you do with the data from this event? What would that data look like? Well, what the data would look like, I don't know, because I don't know what data you you have from the registration process. We're trying to get better at that. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, that's that's been a really that's been a really um, interesting key learning that we've had just since we started um, the company, and that is that the whole thing starts with a data strategy, and most of our customers have no data strategy. So when you look at Adele and IBM's a little bit better from what we can see so far, but but you know. The event organizers are making these sort of decisions about tools and registration and what information to collect and all of that without any real data strategy in mind. And so all of these things are very disparate. Um, so with an event like that, well, with your series of events, we would take all of your data, everybody you know, and then we would enrich that. So we look at third-party data. We have tools to do different kinds of social analysis. We can look at your LinkedIn groups. We can see who's posting, who, you know, what the, who the influencers are on Twitter. So we, we enrich it with all of the other data that we can find. And part of our theory is that most people running events, organizations, know you only in the context in which you, they know you. And if they knew you in a broader context, they could probably do a whole lot more in terms of what they sell to you, how they market to you. Is the product in alpha or beta stage? Um, I'll let Chad answer that question. <laughs> the, product's, the product's live. I mean, we're delivering analytics to customers now, and we have been since the uh, second half of last year. So walk me through a couple of the use cases or scenarios where people actually use it and what would they gain from using it? So, you know, we have... Okay. <laughs> we'll allow it. <laughs> so Leonora covered some of these things, but um, the problem is in the event tech ecosystem, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of different um, technologies being used. And a lot of these technologies now are touting that they have analytics capabilities. And that's fine, but their, their analytics capability are for that particular silo of data that they have. And one of the reasons why we did not um, actually fulfill this, this promise to the market in the context of eTouches is that eTouches had established itself as a very successful worldwide brand as um, an event tech logistics platform. And having a conversation down here on logistics is very different than having a conversation up here about um, revenue strategy and driving you know, top line growth of revenue. So we're in a whole different conversation. But also eTouches, even though it was a fairly comprehensive platform, we recognized we would never have all of the technology. We wouldn't take over somebody's Salesforce you know, solution for CRM. We wouldn't take over Marketo for marketing automation, um, even though we had marketing automation components to it. 
So inherently, there will be a bunch of different technologies in the event ecosystem that a given brand uses. And our job is to really collect that data across all of them. So that instead of getting these siloed analyses, they can actually get analyses across the organization on what's going on in the market. And in answer to your question, so the, the way our, our, you know, our, our plan works is that this year is really a building year. So we have clients, we have client data, we are doing the analysis for our customers while we're simultaneously exposing components of those tools on the SaaS platform. And our plan is that by the end of 2015, we will have built out a significant part of the SaaS platform so that we can then scale the product. So what piece of the product has been used since the second half of last year? So our, our four main pillars of aggregate, um, enrich, analyze, and, and derive insights, um, we've built pieces of all of that. So if you go so can you give me those, one use case where they actually used pieces of it and in like the last six or seven months, they came back and said, wow, now I know who I'm actually coming to, who, who are the folks who are coming to my event. Yeah, so the persona um, analysis yep. for Dell would be a good example. So we were able to um, do persona analysis for Dell and segment the personas around sort of how people consume content at events and breaking up their groups in groups of people who prefer interactive um, you know, hands-on kind of kind of participation, and people who really prefer more didactic, sit back and teach me kind of kind of content. So one of the questions Dell wants to answer is, how do we um, improve our content so that we can attract the right people to the event? Right. So so that's an example of one of the components of analysis that we did for Dell. How do you measure that you have been successful for Lori? Because I'm hearing it, I don't understand it. Like, let's say... If, <laughs> only Yoram would ask that question. But no, go ahead. <laughs> Am I the only one confused here? No. Yeah, so, so when Lori asked me to come here, I said, Lori, this is not a five-minute pitch conversation. It's a very complex topic. So all the questions you're asking me right now um, remind me that... That, that that's true. It is a very complex to topic and it is a series of analyses that we do to help our customers figure out what they need to do in order to make their events effective, right? And so effective is different things to different people. Commercial event organizers, it's about how many people can I get in the room and get to pay the ticket price. For a company like Dell, it's about how is Dell World impacting um, my, my revenues at Dell because we're creating these relationships with people who participate in Dell World. It is very complex and it's certainly not a five minute subject, but it is all about taking big data. Instead of just saying we do big data for marketing, we're focused specifically on big data analytics for the experiential marketing space. So we're, we're very focused on that. So if I had a charity event to pick up a simple example, and last year I raised two million dollars and you cost me something. Can you tell me, look me in the eye and say, I'll get you two and a half million, three million, something that was a good use of my time and money? So, so what we can do right now for what event marketers are doing today is they're making significant marketing decisions without data. Their decision process looks like this. And it's costing them a lot of money. We have countless sort of examples of, of people that we've talked to that have made decisions that have cost them not a little bit of revenue, but 100%. So they could have doubled revenue, and instead they made a business decision based on a whim and didn't have the data behind it. So there's significant outcomes that we can give to our customers, and, and I call these right now low-hanging fruit because they have nothing. They're driving blind right now. And as Leonardo pointed out, the market is vast. They're spending $250 billion a year to put on these events, and they're spending that money. $65 billion. Whatever the number. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a lot of money that they're spending every year on events, and the data behind it is not there. If you look at the digital side of the equation, there's an even bigger spend on the digital side, but there's analytics behind it. So they and, I know, and I know you're skeptical because we can't give you exact examples, but unfortunately, those are proprietary, that's proprietary information for our customers, so telling you exactly some of the problems that Dell is having, which would surprise you because people assume companies like Dell have this all solved, are, you know, are problems that we are able to help them solve by tackling and wrangling their, their event data. I'll give you an, let me give you one example that might help. So, so companies use CRM. 
Um, Salesforce is a popular CRM tool, but Salesforce was not designed to handle events. So big companies that use Salesforce as their CRM find a way to sort of manipulate and hammer their event flow information into their Salesforce instance. Many companies who do that every year change how they do it because it doesn't really work exactly right for events. And so even their Salesforce data from year to year about that very event is not aligned. It's not exactly the same. So that's an example of where taking all of that data, both the Salesforce data and the event data, and putting that together for them is, it, is just that alone is a huge value. Uh, I'm not asking for an answer to this question, but I think the one thing that I didn't get out of this presentation that I think you should need to answer is who, it, who are you pissing off by doing this? <laughs> and, and that might wrap it up and uh, for us to say, oh, okay, uh, that, uh, now I get it. Um, so I, I have no idea like who, who, that, who you're pissing off. Yeah, the, I'm, so, I'm not asking for answer. I don't think I'm not sure you have time, but okay, right, right. I can give you a quick answer. Go ahead, go ahead. So who we're pissing off are the are the the point tools who are trying to say that they're doing data analytics, but they're only doing it on their own data, and so that's a big trend in the event space. People saying you may have heard of Double Dutch. Oh, we do data analytics, but they can only analyze the data that they have, and their clients won't give them other data. So that you know, if, to the degree that we're pissing anybody off. I would say it would be the tools who are trying to imply that they're solving this problem for customers. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, my name is Jordan Weiss. My co-founder Rachel is a little under the weather today, so I'm gonna go ahead and present for our company. So we launched LGBTQD.com to address the significant unmet needs of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community. <coughs> Online dating options for LGBT consumers have fallen short. Currently, their only choices are to join sites like Match or OkCupid, which are primarily focused on heterosexual relationships, leaving them to feel like an afterthought. There are gay and lesbian dating apps like Grindr or Dash, but those are really centered on hookups for just a limited segment of our community. After going through a breakup myself, Needless to say, I was very frustrated with the idea of having to go back to the same old online dating sites. So we created LGBTQD, the progressive online dating and social networking platform of today. Our site promotes serious relationships rather than casual encounters. And we are the only site that exclusively caters to the full spectrum of LGBT sexual orientations and gender identity. And the LGBT market is huge, with $900 billion in buying power. To put that in perspective, our market is comparable to that of the Asian American and African American markets. As society continues to shift towards online dating, the majority of same-sex relationships are actually starting online, and there's no community more loyal than ours. Interestingly enough, LGBT consumers utilize more technology especially when it comes to online dating and social networking than their heterosexual counterparts. And with increasing acceptance, visibility, and legal reform for LGBT people and their relationships, there is no better time than now to capitalize on equality. So LGBT cutie is distinctive in that it is relationship oriented and specifically targeted toward the entire community. People in our community don't like to be limited to identifying as just either lesbian or gay. Our site offers many more options and provides a unique and content-specific platform for its users. So we'll be generating revenue by acting as a conduit for advertisers to reach our robust LGBT audience through sponsored posts, banner ads, video ads, and e-blasts. We also offer a paid premium membership on the site. LGBTQD launched in New York just over a year ago and gradually expanded nationwide. The site continues to see rapid growth and an average of 40 to 50 new members per day. And we have also been featured in prominent press, including editorials from Alley Watch and Kirk Magazine. We have a very strong presence on social media as well, with nearly 50,000 Facebook followers in just over a year. 
And these are some of our strategic partnerships that we have built in order to help generate significant credibility and traction within our community. Our company is LGBT owned and operated, and we truly understand the needs of our community. My co-founder Rachel and I are lifelong best friends, giving the team a strong foundation. We communicate effectively and are quick and efficient problem solvers. We also have our web developer and our blogger who are a part of our community as well, and we have our key advisors. So we initially raised $150,000 from friends and family and are now looking to raise $750,000 in seed funding. And we'll use this investment primarily to build a highly demanded mobile app, to hire key staff, to increase proven marketing methods, and for further branding and development. And all this is so that it can help us achieve a critical mass of users so that we can then in turn generate a significant amount of revenue. So the reason you should invest in LGBT Cutie is because we're not going anywhere. The LGBT market is huge and only getting stronger. Thank you. So you said the customer acquisition cost is approximately two fifty. Yes, yes, and that has gone so, down over time. Fair enough. What's the average time a user on this platform sort of exists? to find his or her significant other? The average time that, I'm sorry, that a member takes to find a significant other? Yeah. Well, that's difficult to say, especially since, you know, we'd have to monitor basically every single person, but we do get um, some people who message us, of course, when they, when they find someone, they thank us and, and whatnot, and... Fair enough. You know, it's very, very difficult to measure that. The reason I'm asking that is, do you have any idea of your LTV? I'm sorry? Do you have any idea of the lifetime value? Oh, the lifetime value? I mean, it's you know projected at this point, but we have a 95% uh, tension rate, and between that and the customer cost acquisition, we projected it to be about $125. And uh, right now you have 40 to 50 signups per day? Per day, yes. What would it take to get to 500 per day? Well, we'd have to, we're, we have to increase our marketing efforts that are working very well, that we're very constrained by our budget right now. We're very stretched very thin on ac across the Facebook and Google platforms that we do very well on, but we can't spend any more money because we don't have it. And those are the two prime channels for you to get the customers? Uh, yes. I mean, we do also uh, do, I mean, we have a very big uh, LGBT expo at the Javits Center that's coming up, you know, on the ground we do stuff as well, but as for a daily thing, we're on Facebook and Google right now. You said you showed some slides before about how big this market is. You said, well, sure. spending power, it's like comparable to the Asian market, the, the national sure. American market. But, but define this for me, if you would, by the size of the population. What is, what do you think right. is the general population, maybe between age 20 to 50 or whatever? How many, are we talking about uh, 50 million people or what? Well, uh, basically, I mean, there have been, you know, we've been in our research, and we have one of our advisors is the head of all LGBT research in, in America. So, I mean, Research basically has shown somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the LGBT population when, you know, it is, of the population, sorry, is LGBT. And you talked about lifetime value, but what, you didn't talk about revenue, revenue sources, um, and why that buying power is an important number. Right. Well, the buying power is an important number because, you know, advertisers really are especially now looking to get in front of uh, you know the LGBT audience, especially even there are even statistics that say they're looking to get in front of an LGBT specific pl platform such as ours. And as we build our user base, you know, to up until that critical mass, it becomes even more attractive to those advertisers. And as that's one of our mainstreams or will be mainstreams of revenue, it you know will be very important so that we can get you know a significant amount and really drive up you know our, our revenue in total. Talk about the revenue picture, uh, a full revenue picture, if you would. I'm sorry. You, what, what is your full revenue picture? It has it right now, or in the? No, no, no. What, what, I mean, how do you plan to, you know, advertising? What else? What else? Is right. Involved? Well, there's that, and there's also a premium membership that we do have on the site, but we, you know, as part of the investment, we want to build out those features more. And between that and building up critical mass uh, of users, it will further will be able to further entice our members and future members to upgrade to premium membership as that's an even quicker source of revenue right there.
and we have some other ideas as well as to you know different. We have we have an LGBT specific events page where businesses can come on and um, you know pay us to sponsor their events. So it's another form of advertising in, in a way, you know. So and we we are always constantly evolving and thinking of new ways to generate you know to generate revenue in the future. Are you targeting the market here in the U.S. or worldwide? Or? Right now we I mean we had started you know in New York to, to test it out and everything when we first launched and now then, then we expanded nationwide as of last spring. Um, so we are in the U.S. right now, but as part of our, you know, um, our plans for the future, we absolutely want to expand uh, internationally as there's a lot more to tackle and there's a very big market, especially in, you know, Canada, you know, in Europe, Australia, you know, whatnot. That retention rate number that you talked about, 95% of them mean much to me over what period of time? Okay, well, I mean, of stay? course, it, it has been since, since we launched, so... So we, we launched about 15 months ago. So that 95% of people stay on the site. They don't they don't leave. They don't delete, you know, their profiles or whatnot. That's what that's what we mean. So by they're not active. They don't delete their profiles. So they're not. They're no longer active. So so what percent of that audience is active? On well, actually, the, they're 50% of our site. Or half of our site are active members. So even even for the for the date for the dating sites, that's a pretty high number. So in the last 15 months, has there been any advertisement push through your platform? And the advertisement, so advertisement. anybody who's been advertising on your platform to your community? I mean, the, the ones that, that we have coupled, uh, that, we, that we've done have been s through some of our partnerships, but mainly, you know, because we're still, I mean, yes, we're doing well, but it's not at that critical mass yet, so that we would be attracted to the big, the big advertisers, big corporations that we're still needing to, basically, we're looking to pour gasoline on a fire that we started, you know, with the investment so that we can really get there at that point. You keep saying critical mass. Right? Yes. So what sort of critical mass number are you looking at? Yes. Well, we believe, I mean, based on the kind of uh, research that we've done and based on past dating sites, that it kind of starts at around 100,000 members. So How many do you have right now? We have over 15,000 right now. So, but we can get there very quickly, you know, with what we're looking to do. So how would you actually, let's say, hypothetical scenario, you get the 1 million or 750k that you're raising. Yes, sure. What are you going to deploy it against it from, from a distribution perspective that you're going to get 100,000 in three months? That we're going to get 100. I don't feel, uh, well, it wouldn't be in three months. It would probably be closer to, to around six, you know, whatnot, because we have to, we do have to build that mobile app first, which will help streamline things. And that, that in itself will take, uh, that, that will take three months to roll out. But once that is also done, in addition to the marketing efforts that we're going to increase and add on, that these aren't also new marketing efforts. These are things that we know already work and that are very low cost for us because it's very effective how we market to our community. Um, the reason I say, I'm not in trouble, the reason I say 100,000 in three months is because that's sort of the new normal. Yeah. And that, that's, that's why I'm trying to push you into that. Sure. You yeah. Know, yeah. Good Absolutely. I mean, uh, we do believe that we get there once we uh, you know, have the, the app platform rolled out. So. I mean, because we are mobily optimized, but of course, having an app is much easier, user friendly, and whatnot. So we wish to strain it. One last suggestion, and then I'll pass on. Uh, just, to, just be cautious. Uh, the uh, raise slide that you put out there, there is an SEC yeah, issue that um, you're only, so it's called general solicitation rule, that you do not put that kind of a slide unless it's all accredited investors that you have. Telling this information to. Okay, thank you. I know this is this is an event that I'm pretty sure people understand, but yeah. just a word of me. Okay, thank you. I, I know a lot of people that belong to that. My neighbor buys the New York Times, and I buy the New York Times, and I'm different orientation. We both buy at Whole Food because we belong to the same socioeconomic platform. So outside the fact that maybe we go socializing in different places, and maybe he may go to events that I may have less interest, the fact that people are of that orientation, almost if I'm an advertiser, it's irrelevant. I'd rather reach somebody where they live because Whole Food is for affluent people, you know, they ch you pay 50% more, and Fresh Direct <laughs> is for affluent people, and it's, it's almost irrelevant what's your orientation. If you go on dating, I agree. If you maybe go to events that she'll organize for you, Again, they, people may, or maybe some political issues about marriage and rights in Mississippi or, or New York State or whatever. I could see that those things people would be interested. 
the rest they behave. My guy at, I worked at Chase, I didn't even know that the guy had DC orientation. We had the same interest almost on anything except one aspect of our lives, which is when we go on dating. And you want me to adjust? No. In Africa and Ukraine and China, there are different needs. Yeah. Uh, and I would imagine that your strategy would be different yes. in those geographies than in the United States. Absolutely. Because in the United States, there are, uh, there are a lot more freedoms that we have here. Yeah. And we take many things for granted. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm not on the investor panel here, but I would, I mean, I think that if I were interested in investing, I'd want to make sure that you had those yes. strategies in place. Absolutely. So my question is, do you, and if you do, Lori, I don't know if he has time, um, but well, what are they? Quick, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, yes, for each, I mean, we're still focusing right now, of course, on the U.S. as we get, you know, bigger and bigger, but, you know, each country is, that we, that we want to tackle is, of course, going to be more LGBT friendly at first, and then as we get to those, the countries that are, as you say, more difficult, and you know, for for the, the citizens that live there, we are going to have to come up with you know, better and more specific strategies to deal with you know how we want to roll out there. So it is more sensitive, of course, as you say. Um, you know, it, it's not the same. Uh, you know, for each place, you can't just you know roll out, uh, you know, as if you were rolling out into the, into another state. So we're definitely going to have to look into that. Hey, one more question. I'm just Go ahead. Um, yeah, so I mean, you're definitely right. There's something like this that's very needed in the LGBT community. Um, the question that I have sure. is, how are you differentiating this from being like a hookup site versus like a long-term relationship right. site? Um, there's a very different attitude that I think the LGBT community Absolutely. has towards that sort of thing as opposed to straight heterosexual yes. having kids. Yes, I mean, we have, you know, a lot of our content on our site. I mean, it is, you know, community, LGBT community specific. I mean, my co-founder and I created, you know, relationship readiness quiz, the LGBT questionnaire, things that are specifically geared towards our community that, you know, kind of orient users to the fact, to the idea that it is relationship oriented. I mean, we don't push, like, you know, the marriage thing, like, so as hard as eHarmony, but we also, you know, it's not a hookup site either, so it's really more, you know, kind of casual uh, relationship type of thing. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. Maury, uh, next question. I'm Maury Hannigan. I'm the founder of MatchClick. MatchClick is a recruiting tool that addresses employers' low response rate when they reach out to candidates. Employers these days, particularly large corporations, aren't interested in the employee in the unemployed people who line up around the block and apply to job boards. What they really want to do is go out and find the high performer that's working for a competitor. They want to go poach the best talent out there. The problem is when they reach out to those individuals, they get about a 5% response rate, whether they reach out through LinkedIn or um, emails, that sort of rate. MatchClick takes that to a 45% response rate. In an $85 billion market, that's a pretty low response rate right now. Let me show you how we do that. What employers are doing now is using really 1990s technology. Um, they're doing text-only job descriptions. Um, they're posting them on job. Primarily, you have to read on a desktop. Um, some of them are mobile-friendly, but what that means is they've taken this text-only job description and changed the size of the margin. And so when you try on your phone to look at any kind of job, it's really pretty unreadable. They estimate that 77% of all job searching and seeking and information happens on a mobile device. And when you're advertising and marketing your jobs on a device where people can't see it and can't read it and can't respond to it, you don't get much response. What MatchClick does is we really use this mobile technology. What I pictured here is what it looks like on desktop, but it's really designed um, for mobile. I don't know that any of you can see it. but. You get to see three videos, one from the hiring manager. These videos are only 20 seconds long. But there's one from the hiring manager, the person that would be your boss. So this isn't some random person in the corporation. This is not a corporate video. This is 20 seconds of the person that you'd work for talking to you about the job. There are also videos from two coworkers, two people that you'd work with. 
There are top three reasons why you'd want to apply. There's a synopsis about the company. Uh, there's a job description because legal departments aren't going to go away. Um, but most importantly, there are, sorry, Laurie. <laughs> we really do love lawyers. We, we love lawyers a lot. <laughs> um, and most importantly, there are social share buttons. So if you're a Python developer and you're not particularly interested in a new job, but you know somebody who's unhappy who's looking, we make it really easy for you to share. And that's vitally important. What you want as an employer is for your job to go viral within your talent community, right? So we're not talking about going viral like Alex from Target. We're talking about within logistics managers, somebody who knows somebody who wants a job, making it very easy to share all of that on mobile. And that's what MatchClick does. This is a very big market. It's estimated just the job board market at $85 billion. The five largest job boards um, average $500 million each. If we just pick off Monster, which is really the dinosaur in the industry, last year they did $770 million. We'll take that as a start. Um, but keep going on that. People change jobs on average every three years. So roughly a third of all working adults are in some kind of job transition, job discovery mode. Why we're different. There are job boards out there. We won the HR Tech Product of the Year Award. Um, that's actually, I like to say, it's like winning the Academy Awards in Guam. Um, they're not nationally televised, um, but they are a big deal in our world. <laughs> um, we've also been adopted by some leading corporations. Um, Citrix and ENY have both completed pilots and become paying clients. We have L'Oreal, Cisco, and a slew of other organizations that are currently using the platform. We launched last June. We have a, um, we've applied for a patent. We do not have utility patent yet, um, but we do have a provisional patent. Um, and I have 20 years experience running a consulting firm in the HR consulting world. I'm, not an, I'm a marketer by training and background. My background is from Procter & Gamble and marketing, um, but I know employment law. Um, as any non-practitioner would know, I know the legacy systems. Another important thing about MatchClick is we are integrated with all of the legacy systems for corporations, whether it be Taleo, SuccessFactors, we're integrated on the front end and the back end, which makes it very easy to use. Um, with my one minute left, I'll skip the fundraising part <laughs> and say thank you. So uh, looks like you're basically making job descriptions better. What is the defensible technology there, and so what, what are you patenting, and, and why is this, you know, how do you build a moat around that? The, the real secret sauce behind MatchClick, MatchClick is really a content management system. For any large employer, they want to make sure that any video or anything that goes out there has been vetted, that somebody has seen it and approved it, and that's really what MatchClick does. We've got a system where um, any hiring manager can make a video with their phone, with their tablet, with their webcam, whatever they've got. We're agnostic to hardware and software. But we'll route it to an approver dashboard. And usually that's the recruiter who takes a look at it. Because eventually somebody's going to make a joke that doesn't you know, belong in a recruiting video or they're going to have some proprietary information or name a client that they shouldn't. So we make all of that really simple. I'll give you a quick example. We're talking to Intuit and they figured out their hiring managers were their best salespeople, right, for any of their tech jobs. They were going to have 600 hiring managers come into a central location and rotate through and make videos about their jobs, but some of the hiring managers had several roles reporting to them, and they realized that by the time they figured out what videos had been approved, what job they went to, how it all worked together, they couldn't handle it. And they looked at MatchClick and they went, it's scalable. Yeah, it's scalable. Um, and that's the real joy of this. We make this so easy for any enterprise organization. We're also built for enterprise. Each recruiter can have their own dashboard. We have all the permissions and, um, and security that the enterprise is looking for. It felt like when you described the product and, and the outreach and, and uh, having a 20 second video from the hiring manager, 20 seconds from the, what, who might be future coworkers, it sounded like you needed to uh, teach the, the client or uh, reorient them on how they do this. Not just a process, like approvals and, and rights management on CMS, but uh, a new way, you need to write new content. You need to do new content, is that right? Or they have the bone, you just need to mix uh, it they're, they're trying to do it somehow. I mean, they've been doing corporate recruiting videos are out there, and they're dreadful. They're, they're scripted, and they're, there's no credibility, no authenticity. 
Um, so they're trying to do these things. They're trying to tweet. They're trying to use social media because this five percent response rate. There's, that's their pain point. They reach out to you know people and nobody responds and they can't build a slate. So they're trying to do these things. Um, there's some things where Glassdoor right now you can attach a corporate video to a job description, but corporate video doesn't do a whole lot for you. So we've sort of put it all together to make it. But, but one of the first things you said was the important things is these new videos. Right. So uh, do you think you'll be helping them do new videos? Uh, tell them here's how you do this or. Oh, what we're doing is actually even on the site, we've got some sample videos for the hiring managers to see and some tutorials, and when the hiring manager gets a letter, it's some, some do's and don'ts suggested. So the, the hardest thing with MatchClick is getting the first couple of videos, because the hiring manager has no idea what he or she's supposed to do. Um, but what we've had, our, our best success has probably been L'Oreal. They got two or three jobs up and posted, and other people saw them, and they had 17 up within a week. So once you see one or two, it's, it's not hard. If I sent you an, an email and said, you know, here's what, what George did, it's like, oh, okay, I, I can do that. I get it. Once you see a couple of them, you get very used to them. So there were two basic, I guess, premises in your original statement. One was the, the normal text job description didn't get you good qualified candidates, one. And second, that most referrals of poaching that HR or hiring manager wants to do is not easily accessible through the text route. How does this make any, it any different or really valuable for somebody outside saying, you know what, I saw the hiring manager, I need to have a chat? What happens is the candidates will at least open the match click profile. Right? Why? Why? Because, because if I said to you, click below to meet your boss, even if you're not looking for a job, you'll click. I mean, that's the results we've got. People are curious enough about who in a competitor company they might work with. They click and at least listen to it. So at least we start the conversation. And if they click and listen to it and hear we're doing open source, we're doing whatever kinds of things that can that can pique their interest, it at least starts the conversation. So I was asking. Uh, right. No, no. So you said you said you raised response rates from five to forty percent or five to forty-five percent. Is that grabber, and you get someone's attention just for a moment, is it because you send that, is the first most powerful grabber uh, sending that video from the hiring manager? Is that what you just said? Yes. So if I'm a recruiter at Omnicom, I send you an, an email that says, love your background, think we have a job you're interested in, click below to meet your boss. Okay. That's that, the and then they click below and they see the match click profile with the three videos. And that's, that's what we're getting, the 40% click. They're clicking to look at it because they're curious enough about what's there. Okay, so that, it goes all the way back to my question about defensibility. Everything you just described is dead simple to copy. And, and all, every time there's a new advertising medium, you know, when, when I sold the, my first internet ad, the click-through rate was like 83% because there's nothing else to click on the page. And, and, so, um, and, uh, and so, so how do you defend it and, and how do you support? I mean, that you're the first one who said meet, you're clicking on meet your boss. If you, you know, in a month, everybody's gonna have meet your boss on there. So how do you, what's your defensibility and, and how do you, you know, get that into the market? Well, to some degree, that you know, a patent's only as good as, as what you you know are willing to defend it. So, is that a deterrent to some folks? Yes, we do. We have patented this whole content management system. Um, that helps us. It's a it's a more complicated system than you'd think. People say, oh well, why doesn't YouTube do this? They have a video player. It's not really about having a video player. It's being integrated with all the applicant tracking systems on one end. It's being integrated with the distribution and apply on the the back end. It's they could. Someone could find another way to do this. Um, we think more likely somebody would buy us rather than try to repeat it. But um, there are folks right now that have a, you know, they'll put a link to a Vimeo um, video. There are things out there. Um, we've got a nice partnership with eQuest, which is the distributor that sits between the applicant tracking systems and the job boards. Maybe more detail than you, you want. Um, no, 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 that's 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 here. That's, 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 that's what you should be talking about. You should be talking about. You should be talking about why your integration with the hiring platforms changes the, changes the entire conversation about your company. The entire conversation. That that is the key. Believe me, the click rate and like, hey, I want to see the boss. Fair enough. Wow factor will fall flat in like five days. 
Well, that key cross integration which says, you know what, it's so seamless that e ENY says, you know what, fine, I can keep this simultaneously, switch off the other one as soon as I get, get much better through match click. That is the key. And that's what they've done. <laughs> you, you, have to have to have to yeah, you buried the lead. <laughs> Assuming you guys do ATSs and distributions and um, all of that. And fair enough, just one last question. So does either L'Oreal or ENY, anybody said, you know what, this is giving me good candidates, turnover is less, etc., etc., whatever the case might be, because I'm pretty sure ENY's competitors, Deloitte might be using it to get EY, ENY's yeah. personnel. Uh, have they seen, okay, you know, turnover has gone down, uh, more good qualified candidates, anything? It, it's too early to see that kind of switching back and forth. Uh, the, the real number we're looking at is who responds to the outreach and how fast can they put together a slate of candidates and what does that mean to their productivity and their cost structure. If you're only getting a 5% response rate, the amount of time and expense to build a slate of five people to come into interview or three people to come into interview just takes so long. When you've got people responding to you, that's the efficiency that corporations care about. They want to be able to get those quality candidates at least talking to folks so they can hire them. Um, and that's the piece that we've got working for us. The last question. Do you have any uh, special solution for creating these videos? Because I imagine their shelf life is uh, not, I don't know what their, shelf, their shelf life is, and you have to refresh them regularly. The hiring managers change, right? The coworkers change. So, is there any special? <coughs> you have any special there? No. To be honest, I'm more concerned about them not changing them out. I mean, one of one of the joys here is that you can now produce video for free, because you do a corporate recruiting video, and you're a hundred grand anyway into that. But your hiring managers can do this in 20 seconds. Well, not well though. You leave it all right. Here, here. Go tell me 20 seconds. Oh, come on. Mine's going to be good, though. You need to coach <laughs> it. But you, you can add a lot of value to it. Give them a script, and there's a way to do this. Have you seen this company, New York called Overture? Uh, you know, I wouldn't do it. You know, I was scared, too. You know, I don't know. That's just one solution. And it works, right? And, and, and it's fast, and it's very efficient. You know what's interesting about this is we're trying to make people not scripted. We, actually, L'Oreal started off scripting their people, and they sounded scripted. We said, let them talk. And scripted they stop their sentences midway through. They push their hair out of their eyes. They're real. And you watch these things, and you believe these people. The credibility and the authenticity here. And because your job candidates are changing all the time, it's not like these are on TV, where it's like, oh, god, it's the Verizon commercial again. Uh, someone who's looking at it. Sorry, if I well, that's why, right. But I think you can add value there too. Mm -hmm. I think they need that. Yeah. The average person doesn't do that well. Does not do that well. But they're real. They're not good, but they're believable and whole. <laughs> Somewhere in the middle. Yep. All right. Okay. We're gonna go on to our last matchmaker today. Thank you. So, hi, I'm Nancy Slotnick, and my company is Matchmaker Cafe. We are a mobile platform that sets up real dates in the real world. Um, I'm a dating industry veteran, and I calculated that I've set up about 50,000 dates in the course of my career. So, uh, as such, I've been able to identify a hole in the market when it comes to the online dating page. So meet Odelia. Uh, for those of you who thought for a second that maybe that was me, I thank you for the compliment. Um, that, that could have been me many years back when I was single. And um, so she's obviously beautiful and smart, and she's a member in our database. Imagine if it were as simple to set up a date with her as it is to order up a car on Uber. Um, that's what we've been able to do with our intelligent dating system. We make it really uh, simple and uh, safe and comfortable for women, and um, they particularly like our platform. So the online dating pain kind of speaks for itself here. Um, it, there are not a lot of real world dates being set up. So about 33% of people that use online dating sites and apps never have an actual date in the whole course of it. And an additional 45% only have one or two dates before leaving unhappy. And we really feel that the industry can do better. Um, uh, the industry is still uh, fairly new, yes. Um, so, but it's evolving, and um, 
you know, it really hasn't evolved yet to offer the kind of user experience that people really want, which is the real date and the real world. So that's what we believe is the way of, of the future. The landscape is very crowded. It's very poised for disruption. There's been a lot of articles lately of, of what's going on here. Um, the, what we've been able to do is glean uh, basically all the best of the different segments. So we have the ease and the convenience of Tinder and some of the other mobile-first apps. Uh, we also have an algorithm like Match and eHarmony. Uh, and then we take what the matchmakers do, which is kind of like the concierge service of actually making the date happen, but we automate it and we bring the price down so that we make it scalable. So I've assembled a team. Uh, my background is that I've built two successful brands in the space. I've been on Oprah and the Today Show, and um, I wrote a book of dating advice that was published by Penguin. Um, I also studied relationship studies as an undergrad at Harvard. Um, my technology team is Justin Damaris is our lead engineer. He built our web app MVP that launched last year, and he comes from Salesforce. Uh, Sarah Walton hails from IAC, which is the leader in the space. They own Match, OkCupid, and Tinder, and so we've been reverse engineering an, an exit strategy, bless you, uh, <laughs> right, right from day one. Um, and then you may recognize Patty Sanger, the millionaire matchmaker, and be wondering what she's doing up there. Um, she's had eight seasons on Bravo of her own show. So last year we did a pop-up cafe in public space to launch the brand, and we got a lot of media attention, and as a result, she actually reached out and said, I want to make a reality TV series about this, this is really cool. So she, we have a development deal with her, executive producing. Um, William Morris Endeavor is representing it, and so we are shopping it to networks right now. We have a simple three-step process. Uh, the first step is both parties have to say yes. Then we go straight to scheduling, and you're offered times in a calendar to choose. Then you pick a cafe near you from uh, one of our venue partners, and it's designed to be a 20 to 30 minute experience so that right on your way home from work, you can just stop and have a quick, easy date and a confirmation email is sent, and we get people to show up. The market is a $4 billion market globally. The traditional uh, leaders in the space, Match.com and eHarmony, um, are, don't have very good brand equity when it comes to the millennials. So um, Tinder has been a game changer in the mobile first, but they don't have a revenue model yet. So our met revenue model is that people pay when the dates confirm. They, we, our research showed that people will pay for dates and that it guarantees that people will show up when they've paid, both parties pay $5 once it's confirmed. Uh, the go-to-market strategy is where I really shine since I've built brands before. Um, we're going to be doing a lot more pop-up cafes. We're going to have more brand ambassadors and a social media campaign launching around New York first. And then we will go city by city with the same model so that by the time the TV show launches in uh, national exposure, we'll be prepared with our national expansion. Uh, my email is nancy at matchmakercafe.com, and I thank you for your time. How many, how many people have downloaded your or users registered from Seattle? Okay, so we have a, a few thousand early adopters from the web app. We have not launched the mobile app yet. So the, what, what the automated part is in development now. So do you have any early data back on usage and satisfaction? Yes. So the, the data that we have is from testing out that this, that this process works and people really like it. We said we're setting updates manually, which is very clunky and we can't set up nearly as many, but people like it. We we're able to set up five times as many dates uh, per customer as the other sites. What are you doing with the um, cafes? Talk about how you interface with the cafes to actually make sure the date happens there. Okay, so, so, so there's two parts of our cafe strategy. There's the pop-up cafes, which are primarily marketing to kind of be out there in, in different neighborhoods, getting the word out and signing people up. And then there are venue partners that are places that are it's primarily drinks. So the idea is that we want it to be like quick and easy. Um, so it's coffee bars or bars or hotel lobbies where you can get a round of drinks and it's safe, it's, it's comfortable and, and we are 
monitoring the people. So we, we have a staff that can be there. We sort of aggregate the dates at certain times, um, weeknights, so we have people that are going around, but it's also the users can report back to us on whether the person canceled or was late. Or, and so there's, there's some element of screening that comes through that without us ha the, having it be as labor intensive to be out there actually introducing the dates the way a matchmaker would. So when you say a pop-up cafe, is it just a, like your marketing board at an existing cafe or is it your real estate, your equipment as a cafe? Well, so you can see the bar in the picture. Like I have two of those bars that actually say matchmaker cafe, but they fold up and they can go into storage. So um, it's, we don't have, we're not signing leases, so we can pop up at any cafe. We can pop up at Whole Foods. We can pop, this was in public space on Wall Street where we launched uh, 75 Wall Street and an outdoor space. So it's very mobile and you know, we even have some plans for like the love van that drives around helping people find love. So it's it's good television, it's good marketing and um, it's fun. And how are you meeting with the venture of the venue partners, so to speak? Oh, so right now we're just in New York because of really getting a critical mass around uh, even the other uh, uh, dating company was talking about this, critical mass is key. So we're doing critical mass just within um, Manhattan and Brooklyn mainly. And because our algorithm uses friends in common, you get sort of the same like crowds of a few thousand people that will all date each other. And that, that's where we're starting. So, um, sorry, I forgot what, uh, what the, your question was. <laughs> no, I forgot your idea. Uh, and the 2,000 early adopters, how did you reach out to them? Um, mainly from my network, so I've been in the industry for a long time. So, um, and we did we did testing on Facebook ads. So we have, um, we, have we we figured out like what our cost of customer acquisition was for for the web app, and, and it's guiding us in our strategy for distribution with Facebook ads with the mobile. Um, we're going to have to do a lot of testing to see, you know, what price and, and what ads we should run, but that's. A key part of our strategy. There's the real world marketing and the television, but then I want to make this viable, even if the TV show didn't happen. This is still a very, very viable business. Um, and because uh, Tinder doesn't have a revenue model right now, this is kind of can be also a companion to um, any of the big companies that are, which do tend to buy up the smaller companies that want a revenue model. So you, you take all the the aggregate of people that'll just sign up for anything, and this weeds out the people that want the real dates. So were the 2,000 paying members? Do they uh, pay anything? No, we're pre-revenue right now. So you don't know if that $5 dates can work? True. I mean, we have been already charging people now to like sign up in the database, and they're actually willing to pay $50. Um, so but you just said you're pre-revenue at the revenue. Right, well, pre-revenue. In the last few weeks, we've been doing this test with, with the $50. So, uh, yes, we've had a little, about $1,000 a, a thousand dollars per right. <laughs> Better than nothing. That's more than Tinder, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, you have Salesforce on the slide. Describe that and, and how that plays into it. Oh, no, I just had Salesforce on the slide because Justin, uh, my engineer, came from there. Is it? Oh, oh, the, oh, the Salesforce right. of the Salesforce. Oh, they were Salesforce, the company. No, a, a Salesforce of people that, you know, will sign up their friends and, pe like, people working in the cafes and sort of matchmakers that will meet people and, and sign them up. So that we're going very manual grassroots right now. So not an actual hired Salesforce to go out and, and track the work. Right. So what, what, what is your critical mass? How many people do you need to make this work? Uh, and, and then how do you think about um, expanding? You know, do you go market by market? Do you unleash the floodgates nationwide? Um, and then, you know, talk about that. A uh, really good question. I, I think that we, you know, it's true that critical mass is important, and, and um, but there's really two Two reasons that a company would would buy a company like this, right? There, there's the user base or the revenue, and um, so I don't think we're going to win any records for user base because Tinder's got like that very you know well started off. So I'm focused on proving that people will pay for this, which is true. We haven't proven it yet until we launch the mobile app. We can't 
we can't prove it, but I, when I prove that this model can work, then it can be built out like crazy. So we really just want to have like a, a, the number of dates be high. So we could have 10,000 members, but if, we, if, if they're all dating once or twice a month, and that's a whole lot more than they are on, on Tinder and the other ones, and they're paying for it, that's a really good proof of concept. And, that, and then the TV show um, will also market itself for us. You seem to be more focused on your exit than actually building a great company. Um, so you fair point. That. <laughs> That's a fair point. Um, I I see uh, I see a hole in the market that is important to do really fast, and I I think I wouldn't only be interested in an exit, but I see that within three to five years there could be a very large exit for a company like this. Okay, Cupid sold to IAC for fifty million, and um, I, I, I'd be personally happy with that. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, 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 but investors might not be. That, that's, a, that's a very fair point. And some people have said that maybe I'm selling the concept short. I, if, if investors wanted, you know, or coming, I'm very early stage. So, uh, you know, my investors will be my partner. If they, if they see vision with me on taking this all the way even bigger, I'm totally game for that. I'm also game for, you know, bringing in a co-founder at this stage that, you know, would would do that. Like if I'm, because I will also be on the TV show and sort of the face of the brand, um, I'm not uh, adverse to bringing in talent that might be able to do that even better than I. Um, I know I could build this to be a $50 million company and sell it. I, I, I think you're right, it could, it could probably go bigger than that. So you said the mobile app is in development? Yes. How long would it take, and how much money would it take to actually build it and put it out there? Right. And so it's going to um, be done by mid-April. Um, we were in an incubator last fall, um, and we won the demo day, so which came with a ten thousand dollar prize, and then I was able to raise about forty thousand dollars more, just you know, uh, sort of angels and momentum from that, and uh, so that's enough to build the app. Um, it's not enough to really build it out and, and distribute it very far, although I can do a lot on a shoestring. Um, so, and I'm, I'm still trying to generate angels as, as I go along. So, um, so uh, we have enough for, for, for now. And, what's that? I can't, can you say how much you're I'm going to be a brief religious moment over here. Sorry. <laughs> Did you say how much you're seeking to raise? Um, I well, didn't say because Laurie advised me very well uh, not to make a public offering, but um, <laughs> so one suggestion I see that you want to do a lot of different things TV, the cafe, the mobile app, etc. What do you want to focus on for the next, say, six months? Really focus and then expand. Yeah. Which one of these three or four different? Uh, things that you have in your head that you really want to do for six months? The, the mobile app product and distribution, 100%. The mobile app will take about six weeks for the product to be launched, and I'm already sort of experimenting with pre distribution channels with this $50 mm -hmm. thing and, and trying trying anything and everything I can, and then just set up, setting up as many dates and getting the word out as much as possible and figuring out which distribution channels are, are going to work best. So if we can get a system where we pay X for a Facebook ad and it gets as, as many customers and then you know we know that yields Y amount of revenue, that, that's where I'd like to be. And then I know it would be really easy to raise whatever amount of money at that point. And from a competitive analysis standpoint, what do you think Tinder is going to be doing next? They say they have a revenue model, um, but they've had different reports on what that is, um, and I don't think it's because they have something so great that they're trying to keep it a mystery. I think they haven't figured it out, frankly. They have a lot of internal problems, because um, their CEO was asked to step down by, for, as president, the chief marketing officer was fired, and they're faced with a sexual harassment suit by the uh, woman that was their co-founder, that was dating one of the guys, and <laughs> they broke up, and he said some horrible things by email, which is really stupid, and so now it, it's a whole thing. Now she's starting a competing site that Badu is investing in, and um, it, 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 so it's kind of crazy, but I, I think they're, they're basically kind of shooting themselves in the foot, and um, they, 
Tinder's probably not going to lose all these swipes, but I don't think they got their revenue act together. And um, so that's why I've been talking about the exit strategy, because it doesn't have to be an exit, but it could be a partnership. If you, if you can tap into the 12 million users that Tinder's gotten in the last two years, that, that would be you know, a really easy way to get a whole bunch of revenue. So, and, and they also um, have never had, um, IAC, they have never had anything um, on television regarding dating. And that, that's, that's not happening for like a year. So to your question, I'm not facing that yet. But that, that anyway, that, that um, is something that is good for them too in the sense that they're a media company um, and they own Vimeo. They own Vimeo. I'm, I'm going to take one question because Paul's waiting to start you. Uh, two practical questions, very short. First of all, uh, you, you said you're going to have some kind of chaperones meeting people at the cafe. A, are they compensated? And what happens if you have a ton of dates? How are you going to make sure you're going to have enough chaperones on location? And you know, how are you going to pay them? Yeah, yeah. The other thing is, the second question is, if you're going to put people who are dating on the internet on reality TV, a lot of these people are shy. That's why they're on the internet. How are they going to feel about being exposed on reality <laughs> TV? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two good, really good questions. Um, for the reality TV question, it's not going to be for everyone to be on the show. It's just going to be for like, you know, select group of people that are, you know, TV friendly and both like being on TV and would make for good television. And that will just be sort of the way that the brand gets marketed. And um, and also the the idea that meeting in person is what we stand behind, and that you know, with all these algorithms and all the the uh, social media, people have sort of lost track of how to date and how to have human connection. So I have kind of a passion around that idea that people need to connect more. And so that's really the core of why, why I do this. Um, as far as the chaperones go, uh, yeah, it does make it sound like it's not as scalable. Um, but because um, we can aggregate, most of these dates happen Monday through Thursday between 7 and 9. Um, uh, and so, but the we can and basically you're gonna date probably somewhere around your work neighborhood, maybe your home neighborhood. But there's about ten neighborhoods around Manhattan and Brooklyn that we would put a cafe like this. And so to have uh, you know, and you can aggregate like people in one neighborhood and one night and so forth. So it's actually not as it's not a guaranteed part of the process. By that point, once we're sending a lot of business to the cafes then the cafes will become our partner in that, and the, um, the people working at the cafe can make the introductions. And that, that's actually how I got started in the dating business, is I years ago had a real uh, cafe that had a dating service for our customers, and all the dates happened there. Okay. So oh. we kind of come, come full circle now. And, um, and that was before, on, I was kind of ahead of the curve before online dating existed. Is that called Griff? Yeah. Oh.